What's up, everybody? What's up, Robert? How welcome. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Yep. Friends and family and enemies to the Beyond Homo Sapien podcast. Yeah, we're slash, going. Slash Robert's show, which is simultaneous. Simulcast, is that what you call it? A simulcast. That's simulcast, what this is. It's yeah. a podcast, a simulcast, a double duo of Doom. Yeah. Double du- Doom. So we're on Paul Tokyozolu's uh, Beyond Homo Sapien podcast, as well as going live on my Facebook feed, um, just talking about spirituality, martial arts, marketing social media all that kind of stuff right yeah i don't i don't know we're talking about something yeah. we're talking about martial arts for sure though because yep. we're here at kogan dojo which yep. is your location yep. here in glen burnie severna park severna park oh i'm sorry is that like is that, a big thing like no the it's just between glen burnie and there's park? there's a couple schools in glen burnie and we're not one of them we're oh. yeah we're we specifically put ourselves in severna park because there were no martial arts no jujitsu schools in severna park there's a taekwondo school or you know just a different thing yeah so um but yeah there were no martial arts schools doing what we wanted to do in Severna park so that's why we're here that's one of the things and that's one of the reasons i wanted to have you on this show is to talk about your kind of unique way of approaching the martial arts yeah. tell us a little bit about that like how do you blend these different arts together like brazilian jiu-jitsu uh and all of the other different striking arts because one of the things i know about you is you've been involved in japanese jiu-jitsu like the old school japanese style jiu-jitsus that you would see in movies or something like that <laughs> and um i don't know and, and i love how you mix that together with a lot of these more modern arts like muay thai yeah. or gracie jiu-jitsu how did that happen for you like what did you kind of what was your journey of finding all these different arts and kind of mixing them all together yeah i mean that's a it's a good question because it it especially in the era of mixed martial arts yeah. what we're doing at kogan dojo is mixed martial arts in the more literal sense not in the branded ufc mma sense um and part of it is just the fact that Bowie, uh my friend and partner and then my brother and myself all have three completely different personalities and three different martial art backgrounds but at the end of the day, we all come together through Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So, like, my brother is one of the people that told me to start Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu mm-hmm. after doing uh, Korean Hapkido for years. I met Bowie doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So we have that kind of overlap. So when um, my brother teaches the Muay Thai, Bui uh, helps to run the, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu program here. And then I run the Japanese martial arts program, which is the Taikyoku Budo. Um, and <clears throat> the way that I got into sort of my own little version of mixed Mm -hmm. martial arts, so to speak, is that I started in traditional Korean Hapkido, which has its roots in Japanese Aikiju Jiu-Jitsu. And through doing a lot of research about the roots of of, um, Hapkido, I ended up being like making friends with and having, I guess you'd say mentors on the Japanese side of the martial arts. Mm -hmm. And then my teacher passed away and I just kind of kept going in that direction. Um, through uh, through doing a lot of research, I ended up talking a lot with Ellis Amdor, who is both a historian and um, an author, and uh, he's the um, head instructor of, or he's a licensed instructor in Tu Koryu, which is the really traditional old, old, old Japanese martial arts. He put me in touch with my teacher, whose name's Bud Yuhas, and that's kind of how I ended up in the, the Japanese side of things out of Hapkido. Mm-hmm. Um, but BJJ just was sort of a natural thing because in, for a couple of reasons, like my brother was recommending that I try it. Um, I was looking for a way to test myself from the traditional side of things where we didn't really do much, you know, pressure testing. Um, and along those lines as well, if you look back historically, the samurai were all grappling. Right. In addition to the weapon stuff that they did, they were grappling. And they were they was in the form of sumo, whether it was informal, like in the dojo or just playing around or whatever. Like Japanese men before judo did sumo just mm. for fun, you know? And um, so it was being done in the dojo, outside the dojo. And so the they had that baseline of skill in in grappling. So that's why, um, as Ellis Emder likes to point out in some of his writing, that, that you don't see a lot of the big um, like hip throws and stuff like that in a lot of the traditional Japanese grappling styles because they already knew how to do it mm-hmm. through sumo. So why would you teach something that everybody already knows how to do? You teach the specialized like skills 
and because the other stuff is already a baseline that everybody has. Mm. But then the problem is once that went away, then you, you don't have it. Then you don't yeah. have it, right? So judo came along and you know, not to get too deep into the history, oh, but it's okay. judo came along and then the old school guys were doing judo, but eventually it led to people specializing in judo and only doing judo. So then the old styles lost the competition side of things right. and just became, you know, not all of them, but most of them just became kata based, you know, and that's kind of what we see the result of these days is that the traditional martial arts is known, are known for being more form based and less sparring based because the sparring went where the competition was, which was in judo. If you look at in our culture though, really BJJ is the grappling outlet for, you know, modern Western society. So yeah. it's in, in a lot of ways, the, the short version of it is that I started doing BJJ because it was the sumo to mm-hmm. my classical, you know, more, more traditional side of, of the martial arts that I wanted a way to test myself in a way, in the same way that I imagined the samurai were for fun and also for, you know, competition. So I started doing BJJ for that reason. And what, what's it been like for you since you started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu I mean, and kind of added that into your arsenal? Like what's that, what type of effects has it had <laughs> on you as you journey to becoming a purple belt now? Well, at first it was extremely humbling and at times even humiliating because <laughs> good way to put it. <laughs> the, the school that I was at, it was a little bit Darwinian in the sense that they like, they really were just, it was a bunch of blue belts and some purple belts. And mm-hmm. I was like the only white belt for a really long time. And they were just tooling me over and over and over again. And sometimes even mocking me in the process, which is not how I would run a school, you know, but it was, it just was what it was. And it was actually almost spite that kept me going back sometimes, yeah. you know, like stubbornness. <laughs> um, but then I fell in love with it. You know, like I, I really love BJJ. Like it's, it's extremely fun. I mean, it's put me in contact with great people, you know, like you and I met Mike Stewart and a lot or got, you know, involved business wise with Mike Stewart in a lot of ways because of your podcast actually, which we could talk about at some point, your original podcast, but yeah, I mean, I, I love doing BJJ. It's a lot of fun. And even now, like we we're just discussing with Nogi, there's so many cool innovations that are happening. And that's the thing that a lot of people don't consider yeah. is that the samurai were actually trying to innovate and get better constantly. So it was never about doing something that because it was tradition. Yeah. It was doing the thing that was going to help you best defeat your opponent, right? So why wouldn't we play around with the most innovative aspect of grappling, which right now is actually no gi BJJ? Yeah, it is. And uh, for people who have no fucking clue what we're talking about, <laughs> um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is, is something that I've been doing for now for almost nine. This will be year nine for me. Yeah, I'm about and five. About five. Yeah. And, um, it's, uh, and I've done judo too, and obviously you've done a ton of different stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, it's basically kind of like the UFC, but with just choking and, and leg locks and arm Short breaking locks, people's yeah. legs and, and arms and stuff <laughs> and uh, no punching. Yeah. And um, right. so if someone's Typically. listening, they're like, what the hell are these guys crazy ninjas talking about? Yeah. And, and even that, it depends because with, you know, with the health and Gracie side of things, it's there a is lot kicking more, and punching. Yeah. It's a lot more self-defense focus and, and it's, there is kicking and punching at least in terms of training against those things. You know? Yeah. 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 What's it had, what has the martial arts, you know, lifestyle taught you about, your spiritual side or your almost your, I don't know how to put it. Your, this otherworldly side of you that we all kind of have that yeah. can be developed through a variety of different outlets, like it's meditation a, it's or a something. Tricky question, right? right? Like we, I've been thinking about this since you and I were kind of chatting back and forth about what we're going to talk about mm-hmm. and everything that a lot of the reason I got into martial arts was looking for a spiritual practice, right? Like, at, at the time, that's exactly what I was looking for. And I had a friend, I told him I was going to get into yoga or Tai Chi or something like that. And it, he, he knew me very well. And he's like, look, you just need to go find, he actually <laughs> pointed me to my teacher, the, my teacher specifically. He said, you need to go here. And, and, and he took me to the school and introduced me to a first martial art teacher. And it really was what I needed. Like yeah. it, it, it was, I would say along the lines of Tai Chi, but with pain, right? Yeah, so, Tai Chi with pain, yeah. that's a good way and, to put and, it. <laughs> and it. It was definitely more of what I needed than yoga or Tai Chi at the time right. because I didn't need 
necessarily a way to be more ethereal and spiritual. What I needed actually was to get more grounded, mm-hmm. right? So what what Hapkido did for me um, in the in the beginning and for quite a long time was actually helped me to find more of the grounded side of my you know my spiritual nature I guess you would say you know yeah. and I mean we could obviously get into like defining those terms and things like that but really at the end of the day I think that we each have sort of the essence of who we are mm-hmm. and either the thing that we're, the things that we choose to do are either resonating with that and increasing that in a good way, or they're dissonant with that and, and really decreasing that in a bad way, mm-hmm. right? Like one way or the other, you know? So I, for me, Hapkido really resonated with who I was, but also in a way that made me better at in general, you I mean, know, the yeah. human thing, the, yeah, the human thing, the beyond, yeah. you know, beyond homo sapien, you know, like the, the subject of your podcast, you know, that it really made me a better person. Now, I don't actually think that martial arts do that in their, ver- like, in their, yeah. in their nature. <laughs> I think it depends on who you are and who your teacher is and yeah. what the practice is, you know, that I've met a lot of assholes in jujitsu. Yeah. Well, I I, there's a, there's a quote from Sigmund Freud, like he said that cocaine enhanced people's personalities then somebody said well what if you're a jerk right and they use a different word but like that's the question yeah martial arts enhance people's personalities oh yeah if you're a jerk it might just make you more of a jerk you yeah know? I've Which seen that. i'm sure that some people would argue that that's the case with me but <laughs> <laughs> hey there's a, there's a there's a fine line between being egotistical and being high and being uh confident yeah being yeah. super confident about something you know you have to have tons of confidence to go after things in your life like opening a business or competing in martial arts or whatever Mm -hmm. but you also have to be humble and not be an asshole and it's kind of a weird thing to cross the difference between being an asshole versus just being a very confident person and one of the things about the traditional side of of martial arts specifically in the japanese martial arts which i'm still just scratching the surface on but my teachers try to impress this upon me Mm -hmm. over and over again in spite of how thick-headed I am is that respect is the foundation of Japanese martial arts not just because I should be respectful to you but because actually it's the way to get more of what you want right not in like a selfish way but in the way that if I'm not causing friction between us then things go more smoothly Hmm. right yeah and and so True. A lot of the a lot of the samurai history actually was about changing society along the terms of what they wanted it to be like. Well, you don't do that always with force, right? So it's it's also with you know the way that you present yourself. Like if I'm always bumping heads with people and if I'm always bumping into people and everything that I do, it's gonna be way harder for me to get what I want later yeah you know and like i said not in a selfish way but like in a good way like if we want more kids on the mat to do jujitsu if if we're jerks all the time it's gonna ruin our reputation and it's not gonna work right Right. so that respect is always at the foundation of of what we're doing and that also goes along the lines with like you know how you present yourself on social media you know and and how you how you carry yourself in the store like uh actually buoy and i were talking about this the other day that we have um one of the vehicles has branding on it. Hmm. Well, you can't drive around like a jerk in the vehicle that has the branding on it. Yeah. You know, you, you have to have respect on the road because it starts to ripple down and reflect through everything else. Yeah. yeah. It's just a preeminence of who you are. Yeah. Is that you become this archetype of the martial artist. And that's something that I've kind of been thinking about in, rel- in respect to this conversation is archetypes the archetype of the kind of the martial artist or the martial arts instructor feels like it's something that we've kind of gotten away from right because in the stories in the old in a lot of times the martial arts instructor plays the same role in in stories in mm-hmm. in, in old stories at, as the the wizard as the, like a as shaman the, right yeah. yeah the guru and the shaman yeah, yeah. as the gandalf of mm-hmm. the story you know like look at mr miyagi and karate yeah. kid he's the gandalf of the story you know if we're looking at um the hero's journey uh then you know basically it's this whole idea that this is the character the mentor character who calls out to the hero and says 
this is your time. This is your call to become the fullest version of yourself. Mm, interesting. And then the martial arts teacher plays an important role in that character's spiritual and physical and mental development. And I feel like that's something that gets lost in this society, even as we kind of modernize a lot of this stuff with MMA and jujitsu, which I love. Mm -hmm. I love that modernization. I think it's fucking cool. And I really enjoy it, obviously, being here about to do some jujitsu here yeah. in a minute on nice, clean mats in an air conditioned space instead of on the, you know, in the jungles or on some mountain where I had to climb to the top of the mountain and pick a flower yeah, wait and, outside the the dojo for a month yeah, yeah or something like but that's always the old archetype right is that this teacher is going to give you this lesson and yeah i feel like that gets lost what do you think we can do about that what's the answer there where can we bridge the gap between like modernization versus kind of keeping this ancient tradition of kind of the martial arts teacher as like a spiritual dude you know spiritual guru like obviously you're a martial arts teacher and so so am i but i'm not I'm not like, you know, sit, you know, bow down students, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, and I, I'm trying to do that either. Maybe every once in a while, you know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, I don't know, because that, it, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because we're, we're running a business yeah, as well as being martial art instructors, right? So, like, I think that the short answer to that is something that, that the three owners of this school have discussed, like, over and over and over and over again that we have to first and foremost do what we feel is right, like in our conscience mm -hmm. before the business, right? Like, because what you're talking about with modernization and everything, really what you're talking about is the commoditization of martial arts, right? That it's yeah. for sale, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's very easy to maintain high standards when you have three students in a basement, right? And this is something that's come up because we literally started in my basement and uh, as one of my teachers said, you can be as ruthless as you want to when they're not paying you, you know, and, and actually true. They, they, they were paying um, because we were treated it like an exchange for time. Yeah. Right? But now we have rent to pay. Right. And we have instructors to pay. Like we have a lot of instructors to pay. Um, and we have to keep the lights on and we have Wi-Fi. like we're doing this. Yeah, you know? great. So it, it really, that really changes the dynamic of how you, how you think about the school. And I think one of the things that we've decided from very early on is that we're never willing to do the thing to make money that would cost us our integrity, right? Mm -hmm. That it's not worth it, right? So like, even when you get down to, you know, like we have people that train here that came from other schools, we literally never reached out to a single one of them and asked them to come here. They left the school and came here on their own. We, we, do not talk bad about other instructors while we're here. You know, like we, we don't mention people by name when we don't have something nice to say, you know, things like that. And, and also when it comes down to like what we teach and everything, like we had to decide what kind of school we wanted to be. We wanted to be the kind of school that we could be proud of, not just that, that made money. And mm -hmm. part of that for us is we just all have day jobs, you know, yeah. because we have, we're growing at a healthy pace that allows us to be who we need to be on, on our personal lives, you know? Yeah. Um, and so for, for us, like we've talked a lot about um, having tenants, you know, um, as a business that uh, first and foremost is that respect has to be first, right? So respect for each other, respect for the students, respect for the community, um, all of those things. And profit comes later. You know, like profit should be the result of having good principles, mm -hmm. not the other way around, you know. And so that, I think, kind of answers the question, yeah. you know, um, because at the end of the day, I don't want to change the thing that I'm teaching just in order to get more students. Yeah, um, I, it, it is what it is. Right. But then also we live in a culture where people say, if I give you this amount of money, then you give me the product that I want in return, which is not the way that martial arts are typically, you know, no. not, <laughs> historically not the way that they're taught, you know, not so. at all. Mar especially with the types that we're involved mm -hmm. with here with jujitsu, with Brazilian jujitsu uh, and some forms of Japanese mm -hmm. for sure. But uh, this idea that it's one of those last things where you find a teacher for yourself, yeah. you know, like that's not something that that's one of the things I've always loved with Brazilian jujitsu is 
you find an instructor who's going to be the one that promotes you and you have to build a rapport and a relationship with this person over a long period of time right. and you find your teacher and yeah that's that's a huge part of it that yeah. is missing in a lot of other areas of life like digital marketing for example i don't have like a digital marketing sensei mm -hmm. you know and honestly right now i don't even have a jiu-jitsu teacher i because i've been traveling and moving around so much but that's something that i like I feel missing in my life. Yeah. You know, it's like a, it's a very important relationship. It is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things too is like my my teacher and I have have talked about this in re, in exactly regards to that very recently that you can't make everybody happy, right? So you have to decide like basically I and mean, Bob Dylan has a song you got to serve somebody, right? Yeah. Like in you can't have too many teachers before you have no teacher at all, right? You have to dedicate yourself to something. You have to dedicate yourself to, to a path, right? Because otherwise you're just wandering around, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe that ties into the spiritual side of things, right? But yeah, that is a big part of it, man, is that dedication of yourself to a path. Like something I've been learning about more lately is the quest for the Holy Grail. Hmm. And this is something I've, I've been studying. I've always been interested in King Arthur and the myths of the Holy Grail, but I've been really studying it more lately as to like, what is this actually about? And the reason it became so interesting is because it resembles the martial artist path quite a lot. And it's supposed to be symbolic. The story of the quest for the Holy Grail in the traditional stories of Arthur and his knights and all the other stories surrounding the Grail, for the most part, it's a search for personal mastery. Mm. For it's the, the quest for the, for the Grail is supposed to be symbolic of your own quest for mastery over yourself which is very symbolic, very similar to the martial arts path. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why it's so such an intriguing topic for yeah. me, yeah. because it's supposed to be a personal dedication that you make to yourself to mm -hmm. undertake this quest of personal mastery. And you're going to find your own personal Holy Grail, whatever that looks like. And mm -hmm. the, and the, and, but it's a personal dedication where you say there's no one else can help you on your way you're going to have to figure out this journey for yourself. And that's a lot of what the martial arts path is. And that's why it's so akin to the spiritual journey, I think, is because it's almost like training for that inward internal journey that you might have through some sort of a, like if you were to become a monk or mm -hmm. something like that, the same yeah. sort of, the same sort of journey would apply where it's a personal thing that no one can do this for you. No one can learn jujitsu for you. Um, but they can, they, and, and it's something that you have to dedicate to yourself. Because no one, you know, like Mike Johnson, one of my first instructors, was never, you know, beating me, beating me up to get me to come to class. He would just kick my ass when I came to class and then be like, well, uh, see you, you should come more often. See you, yeah, <laughs> see you next time, maybe. Yeah. You know, that's always what it's been like for me. The jiu-jitsu journey, the martial arts journey in general, it's always that internal dedication of I will show up and do this difficult thing again, yeah. even though last time I got my ass kicked and it was hard. And I went home sweaty. Guess what? I'm going to show up again mm -hmm. and again and again and again and again and again for years. Yeah. And that is the discipline mm -hmm. that gets developed. And it can get developed, again, across a variety of other topics. But this is where I think there is that crossover between something like martial arts or it can apply to dancing or yoga or gymnastics or anything. But martial arts is especially... Uh, significant because it's so violent because it's such a difficult thing especially if it's talking about Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu or Judo or wrestling or boxing or any of these things the really hard ones it's like man uh, I mean yoga is a feat I love yoga but it's difficult to show up to yoga practice every day it's a lot harder though to show up to Jiu Jitsu practice every day when you know you're just going to get your ass kicked for a couple hours yeah. so making that internal personal dedication of saying I will do this thing forever. It's huge. And it yeah. mirrors the spiritual or the, the commitment you make to undertake a personal development system in general. Yeah. I'm, and I've always said, which injuries aside, right? Yeah. Getting injured is a whole separate thing. Um, but I've never shown up to class, no matter how I felt before going to class, whether I'm teaching or whether I'm I'm a student. I've never shown up and felt worse afterwards. Mm -hmm. Right. So there, there's a, a saying that a friend of mine has mentioned to me over and over and over again to, over the years that it's easier to change your mind with action than it is to change your action with your mind. 
right? Mm. In other words, if you go do something, it will change you faster than if you think about it a lot, right? Yeah. And so sometimes when you just don't feel good, show up anyway and do the thing, you know? And in that way, I mean, if you, you know, if you think about that as, as being a spiritual practice, like the whole point, I, I was just listening to Tim Ferriss talking about meditation. And he said, one of the biggest mistakes people make with meditation is they, they set up their perfect little meditation station in the morning. Nobody's around. It's quiet. It's perfect. They have their candles and their, you know, their singing bowl, whatever. Yeah. And that's the only time that they meditate. And then they go out into the real world where it's not like that at all. And they can't maintain their, that state because mm -hmm. they're not practicing in the environment that it actually matters. Well, martial arts, if you're allow it to, then it allows you to, to sort of train that mindfulness state where, where it matters, which is where it's difficult, right? So like if you're rolling for, if you have like an, a one hour open mat and you're rolling with, you know, whatever, 10 guys for an hour, like back to back, back to back with no break, you either find that mental space of calm and peace or whatever, or you don't, and you're really tired when you're done, yeah, you know? and it sucks. And, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And I mean, I think that if there is a, an overlap to spirituality and in martial arts, I think a lot of it comes down to finding that flow state. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I, this has been on my mind a lot lately that like, no matter the criticism that Aikido gets, one of the reasons that so many people are so attracted to it, especially like, you know, more on a spiritual, on a, people that are, are claiming to be looking for more of a spiritual side than a martial side from a martial art. I think a lot of the reason that they're attracted to it is because they're finding that flow state within the practice that it's throw and fall and throw and fall and throw and fall and and a constant a constant cycle of throwing and falling and throwing and falling and it, it it looks bad a lot of times to somebody who's done bjj or wrestling or whatever, yeah. or whatever but if you look at the thing that it's doing for them instead of the thing that you want to see i think that their value is in there Right? Yeah. In the same way that like you and I, if we show up and we don't set the timer and we just we just roll for an hour that we're going to find that that state where like you there's a flow, there's a flow. And because if you use too much muscle, if you use too much cardio, you cannot roll for an hour. Right. Yeah. I mean, unless you're some kind of supernatural athlete, but you have to find that state where you're. Um, where you're tapping you're into some, yeah, you're tapping into something then that's deeper than the your prefrontal cortex, you know, and and your uh, and your subjective strength, you yeah. know. Um, and I think that that's where, um, I think I honestly that's where something like Aikido is actually really valuable for people that aren't really that interested in beating each other up. They're really just interested in finding that flow state. Yeah, because that flow state's a drug, man. Mm -hmm. That flow state feels pretty fucking good when you get there. Yeah. And what we're starting to see more and more, and one of the reasons why this is such an interesting conversation, especially around the topic of human evolution, is a big part of what we're seeing, I think, is going to be a, sh a cultural shift away from a lot of these fundamentalist religions to some degree and towards martial arts communities. So, yeah. Because they're finding that, I think that people are going to find the similar... Um, similar they get this they get the same benefits and more mm -hmm. like i remember the day because for me and people who listen to my show know that like i i grew up in fundamentalist christianity uh here in maryland and um i left the fundamentalist community when i was like 17 and i started to do a lot of jujitsu around that time and i remember the day when i realized i've been doing jujitsu a couple of years at this point and it had become like my new religion my new thing it was like you know on sunday morning i'd go to train a jujitsu sunday morning class has always been my favorite yeah, yeah. Sun for a lot of people though mm -hmm. and a lot of people show up on sunday morning jujitsu and everyone's always cracking jokes like about how oh uh, you know this is my religion my church you know here here instead of church it's like yeah but but really for real like that's because you're tapping into a similar sort of thing the right. community the community aspect is strong and also it's something where you are confronting your ego confronting yourself and you're going to you know dive into some deeper place yeah in some variety yeah and that's what people look for for a religion they look for some place that lets them explore themselves and they get community and it's a safe place and they can talk about stuff going on in their lives and they see their friends and they make some new friends and it's replacing that too not obviously not you know overnight but yeah. 
I mean, I think gradually, especially with the young, with my generation, I think, because this is what I've seen. I know a lot of people like me who left religion and what they're looking for is they're saying, okay, but we still want a community. Yeah. There's lots of people who are leaving religions and there's kind of this mass thing happening, especially with people in my generation, a lot of people leaving these fundamentalist religions and they're saying, okay, what's next? Cause we still want a community. Yeah. We still want, fr- we still want a group of people. One deep, meaningful connection. Yeah, jiu- right? and then yeah. martial arts can give you that. Yeah, yoga yeah. can give you that too. Well, but martial arts, especially because you fight each other. A perfect example is Go actually out. your original podcast, so Matt Trick's podcast. Oh yeah, right? is that is that the original name? Matt yeah, Trick's. well, no, the original was Trek Jitsu. Trek Jitsu, was yeah. The so OG, so you're an OG what, fan. Yeah, when it when it was Trek <laughs> when it was Trek Jitsu, you had Mike Stewart on your show. Yeah, I did back in and back in the day. You and I had <laughs> never met. We weren't even friends on Facebook. Nothing, but um, so I guess. I was friends with Mike Stewart on Facebook because uh, he had had Peter Sauer and Helsen at his school for a, a joint seminar, and I attended that years ago, and it was it was really fun. I mean, it was it was a cool experience to see how different those two guys are. Yeah, you know? these two masters, completely different personalities. Oh, I'm sure. I'm um, sure. And uh, so he and I were friends on Facebook, and I saw him post that he was on this podcast, and I had just started getting into podcasts, so I listened to it, and that started our business relationship, which took a little while longer, but it was the podcast that actually initiated that because when he was talking about paying his instructors, um, when um, he was saying how he, uh, whenever he gave up some aspect of the business that he would have been clinging to for control, Mm -hmm. that it allowed him, whenever he gave it that responsibility to someone else and they did it well, it allowed him to do bigger and better things for the business. It was just these different little little sort of cues that really resonated, you yeah, know, talking about huge. resonance again, you know, talk, that it resonated with how I imagined a martial arts school should be run. And also he was doing really, really well. Mm-hmm. And it actually was the thing that proved to me that it was possible, you know, to actually run a, a martial arts school well, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and cause my first teacher really struggled, you know, financially with, with martial arts. Like, uh, it was, it cost him money every month to run a school. Right. Um, and, and so through that, that's how you and I started chatting, you know? So like the community is so multifaceted, mm-hmm. um, and here we are here, we're affiliated, affiliated with Mike Stewart <laughs> on the jujitsu side. It's crazy you know? how it works out. Yeah. Yeah. And then people are here building a community. Right. And yeah. I was just you know, honored to make the connection, but, yeah. uh, but that's one hell of a connection, man. Mike Stewart's a badass yeah. for real. Yeah. I love that dude. He's a good guy. And, um, it's, uh, but it's, it's amazing how these little synchronicities happen that lead to something bigger and something better. And yeah, I just, I don't know. Jiu Jitsu's done for so much for me, man. It really is the foundation of like everything that I will ever achieve. Mm. It's, it was the thing that kind of got it all started was martial arts. That's how I lost a ton of weight, mm-hmm. quit smoking, quit drinking so much. And yeah, back when I was like 19. And uh, yeah, just totally shaped who I am today. The foundation well, of everything. You were in Europe for a while yeah. in the military and the school that you were training at was mostly no gi. You had a lot of the Dan or her death squad guys coming out there. Yeah, we had a few of those guys come out like Ethan Carlinson and Oliver Taza and Nikki Ryan. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was great. Those yeah. guys it's really been a big topic lately just because oh, they're yeah. really, no. well, it, you know, it goes back to the innovation side that, that Dan Hur's guys are, they're just showing that if you have a systematic process, uh, a path that's, you know, laid out for you, if you follow it, then good things can happen. Yeah, man. And that's one of the things I love about jujitsu is it's so systematic and it shows you the importance of it, of a good system. Mm-hmm. And then that's something that you can apply to your life in a bunch of other ways. And I know we got to wrap this up here soon and start training. Yeah. But uh, what are some, let's end on this. What are some of the like very tactical things that you've taken away from jujitsu that help you in your life outside off the mats? Mm-hmm. What are like a couple things that come to mind? Well, I mean, one thing is that no matter how difficult it gets, if you can breathe and keep your head together, then um, you'll make it through. Yeah. And, and that's a huge thing because I was really claustrophobic when I started doing jujitsu. And I used to actually count in my head the amount of seconds before I would tap to pressure, mm. right? Like this time it's going to be five and then it's 10, you know? And 
eventually you get to the point where it doesn't bother you anymore, right? So being able to survive under pressure, things like that, that obviously translates, you know, metaphorically to a bunch of other aspects of life. But now, actually, one of my big focuses is, and we were discussing this earlier, that I've been trying to do a lot more nogi. It's really teaching me not to hold on to stuff so tightly, right? Ooh. It's a good metaphor. Yes. In the gi, it's so easy to create more friction and more tension Nogi, I'm literally, I, this ties back into Aikido, actually, that I'm trying to roll Nogi open-handed and not grab onto everything mm. and see where the flow takes me, right? Oh, that's really cool. And yeah. then you, at, when you get to the, when you get to the proper position, then you snatch on and that's where you pull the submission, right? So don't grab onto things until the time is right. You know, mm. I mean, the good metaphor. Yeah, you know, those like, are all very good metaphors. Yeah, like, stay open, stay. You know, don't hold on to things too tightly, and wait until the timing is right, and then and then take what you got. You know, that's huge. Yeah. Those are good ones. It's been. It's there's some some blog posts that I've been thinking about <laughs> writing lately, actually. Yeah. So I mean, for anybody that doesn't know, I I've been trying to write a daily blog. It's a good but, blog um, for sure. And I missed a I few like days a, a week or so ago. So I was with my grandfather. He passed away at oh, 96. Sorry about that. He, had, he had a really good life. 96 you know, for, is a long 96 life. 96 is a long life. And up until up until he was 94, oh, he was still driving and playing saxophone in a jazz band. Like, he did he did really badass. well. But That's I got awesome. to be there for that. And I just decided that I was going to take a little break and not write anything for a little bit. Yeah. And then when I, I've started to get back into the daily blog post thing. But it, it ties into what you're talking about. That like how the path of martial arts or even travel or interpersonal experiences, you know, all those things, how, how it's a path, you know, mm-hmm. if you're looking for the signposts, if you're looking for, um, if you're looking for the clues, you know, it's, it's like playing a role playing game in a sense, you know, like yeah. <laughs> legend, legend of Zelda, you know, you, you walk into the inn and, and the innkeeper says, you know, here's the map, you know, go into this, uh, go to the next village and find the, the wizard, you know, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it seems silly, but, but this is how I, you know, I grew up playing that kind of stuff, like playing role playing games, playing video games. And that's kind of how I feel right now. It's like, you know, you, you hit me up and you say, Hey, are you going to be around this week at Kogan? And that's my next clue. You know, it's like, okay, here we are. We're doing the podcast, you know, and then yeah. let's see where this leads us. And it's an adventure. I know. I love it, man. Just one thing after the next. And it yeah. makes it so you may you can become a lot more resilient, I think, mm. in your martial arts. Yeah. You gain a lot more mental toughness for when it's a little bit more difficult. Well, so something I always ask people when we have guest instructors in here, I'll ask you well, while we wrap up, what is two things? One, what is your jujitsu superpower? Like, what is the thing that you're really good at or that you're really focused on these days that is sort of unique to you? Like, what is your individual path at this moment in, in jiu-jitsu? Mm, I'm really flexible. Mm, I do a lot of yoga. Good. And that leads well to, uh, to jiu-jitsu. <laughs> I, I got dance moves, Yeah, too. I think that's my brother's phone. But, so uh, the yeah. other question then yoga for sure yoga, yoga, yoga. is my jiu-jitsu superpower <laughs> there you go so that, that's good actually we just started adding a bunch of yoga classes here. oh it's, it's game changing yeah. like life changing yeah. yoga is amazing that's really <laughs> so the other question is when you first started doing jiu-jitsu what if you could go back in time to when you first started doing jiu-jitsu what would you tell yourself that you wish that you knew hmm. I think this is the timer. I think it is a timer. timer. I don't think it's going to stop. I don't think it's... <laughs> Let's see. Something that old me wish... Old... So, so, no, so one more time. For, for posterity, that was, that, was, <laughs> that was my brother's wife calling. So, Connie, if you're watching, I I, uh, I just turned the phone off because <laughs> Matt's in class right now. <laughs> but he's alive and well. He's yep, teaching he's class. Good. Yeah, he's doing good. He's safe and sound. Yeah. Yeah. At least we think we haven't seen yeah. I mean, you know, he yeah. might have gotten kicked in the face. That might be. But, um, but yeah, so something that I could have told myself back in the day, um, to be honest, I think it would have been to do a lot more movement training, mm. to do a lot more, yeah. uh, a lot more like bear crawls and kettlebells and yoga and yeah. dancing. I don't know, like cartwheels and gymnastics. Because when I first started jiu-jitsu, I thought it was all um, all cardio and strength. So, well, mostly cardio, because when you when you first start out with a martial art, 
as especially something like jujitsu, you think like, man, I'm ga- I'm always out of breath. Yeah. I'm I really have to out try of harder. Yeah, yeah, I gotta run more. Yeah. I gotta do more jump rope. I gotta do more this, more that. And the answer is no. You gotta learn how to breathe properly. So when I learned how to breathe through doing yoga, that's when things really started to change with me in the jujitsu world. And that's when I started to really become, I don't know, like better, a lot better at it just in general. But uh, also stuff like more cartwheels, more gymnastics, and honestly, more time at just jujitsu class itself. Like when I first started, I was also doing ninjutsu mm-hmm. two days out of the week. I was doing jujitsu three days and ninjutsu two days out of the week because I've always had wanted to do ninjutsu. And it was fun, but ultimately ninjutsu is kind of bullshit, honestly. Sorry, ninjas. <laughs> I learned some cool moves with the sword and with the bow staff, but for the most part, a lot of it is bullshit. So I would have been like, hey, man, you know, you're suspicious. Because I did it for about two years. I did ninjutsu for two years. And that's two years where I could have been doing jujitsu five days a week instead of three. Because I was, I was going to training. I was going to ninjutsu two days a week, jujitsu three. But I could have just gone straight jujitsu. Um, and I probably would be a lot better, but I don't know what, maybe my ninjutsu super, maybe that's like my secret is the yeah, ninjutsu maybe. little subtleties that I do. I don't think so, but, uh, probably that be like, Hey, you know, your suspicions that ninjutsu might be bullshit. You might be wasting your time. They're right. You know, I would have gotten out there a year early maybe, but it's cool. Ninjutsu is fun. I got a green belt. So it's fun. You know, yeah. I, met, I met a lot of cool people. People I was doing ninjutsu with are cool as shit. Nice guys in Columbia. Well, Mike Great Stewart team. is one of them. Right? Mike, Stu- so, yeah, Mike Stewart so was uh, – I didn't train with him, but I – He had already stopped. Yeah, he had already yeah. stopped. But uh, Mike Stewart was uh, – but he's second-degree black belt in ninjutsu. Very legit, of course. You know, very uh, very good at throwing stars. Um, <laughs> that's why I'm so sneaky. It's the ninjutsu yeah. background, of course, you know. But um, <laughs> No, but it's cool because, I, I mean, obviously one someone could just look at how I – you know how I dress most days and be like, oh yeah, clearly, it's a ninja. clearly I want to be ninja. Like these are my shoes, man. I just got yeah. these shoes from Vibra. Yeah. They're like just they're just straight up ninja shoes. And um, see, I just wear I just wear black so I don't have to worry about if I match. There you go. That works. Yeah. That works. So we got to wrap this up. We got to go train. But before we do, thanks, man. Thank what, you. Where can people find you? What can people? Where, what do you? Anything you want to promote? So we're at, um, we're in the heart of Savannah Park, kogandojo.com. Um, and then my blog is holisticbudo.com. Uh, and we are at 549 Baltimore Annapolis Boulevard. We have Gracie Jiu Jitsu kids and adult classes, Muay Thai kids and adult classes, Taikyoku Budo, which is the Japanese um, martial art program. Uh, that is for adults only. We also have yoga, kettlebells, uh, good stuff. That's good stuff, man. Yeah. Yoga and kettlebells is something I've been trying to do a lot more yeah. the past couple months. It's a good addition. So. Oh yeah, yoga will change your life, man. Have you tried? Have you started with yoga? Not yet. I've been oh. doing. Oh my god. I, I've been doing the qigong classes. Okay. So, so. Qigong is yeah. a bit similar. Similar yeah. idea. It's st- to a, standing, to you know, working on stretch connections and breath control yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. Robert, your man. Thank you. you. Thanks for coming out. Thanks, dude.